Good morning to you all. Uh, today we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about logo design, which I think is something that is always very entertaining. Um, it's, it's fun to see what you guys come up with in terms of logos, but it's also fun to go through um, objects that we see so often. Uh, and a lot of times we stop thinking about them and we just, uh, you know, it, it's just we're bombarded with them every day. Uh, you know, whether it's Starbucks or, or, you know, your computers, Dell, whatever, these logos exist everywhere. Uh, there's so much corporate branding that happens. So it's fun to kind of dive into that and to also think about how it might apply to you. So um, an effective logo is a distinctive one. It's something that is, is easily recognizable. That's the purpose of a logo. The best logos don't require anything other than the logo to identify the brand. Um, they're generally very appropriate for whatever it is that they're trying to brand. Um, they're practical, they're graphic in their, their layout. They're usually pretty simple in form. If they're too complex, they, they tend to get lost over time. Um, and generally, they're going to convey some kind of an intended message. Uh, so if we look at some of the, the very iconic um, images, for example, uh, the Shell gas station. I mean, it's, it's about as simple as it gets, but it's something that you see all the time. And you immediately associate that. I mean, it's really easy to be driving down the freeway. Let's say you're driving on Highway 80 towards Sacramento. It's really easy to see the giant Shell logo. It doesn't even require any text. And you know, oh, that's a gas station, and that's where I'm going to stop. So it's, it's something that's just built into us. Um, you know, a lot of the TV companies, the NBC, uh, ABC logo, I mean, ABC logo is about as simple as it can possibly get, but it's still a rather iconic, something that you would recognize very, very easily. Um, simplicity, it, easy recognition of the logo is key. I wouldn't say that the Starbucks logo is necessarily simple, but at the same time, the picture of the woman with the star has absolutely nothing to do with coffee. Nothing at all. But we all completely associated with the Starbucks brand and Starbucks. And so it's a really interesting thing to think about. Like this is something familiar. If I, if I didn't show this image and I said, can any of you, I mean, tell me what the Starbucks logo is, you would all say, oh, it's that green circle with those lines and there's, there's like a lady on it or something, right? Because you would know by recognition what that is. Uh, and it's actually kind of an interesting logo to begin with. Right? I'm going to show you some logos that haven't really taken off, but they're kind of fun. Um, and they're plays on, on various combinations of words. Um, and they're, they're well done. I apologize that they're a little bit um, blurry. Enduring, right? This is something about not following fads. Right? There's trends that happen in the world of design. And you want your logo to be able to either adapt to trends or survive from trends. Um, so if it's trendy, then it's going to be out of fashion. Okay? Um, make it future-proof. Right? If it's simple enough, it can be future-proof. Right? If the trend is 3D, you know, slight embossedness to a logo, and you can add a little bit of that for the time being, and then the trend goes away to flat design, where it's just a color, and you can do that, it would work. So something like the Twitter logo, the logo itself can stay essentially the same, and you can make subtle tweaks to it or to the color to change it as the fads go past. So you want to think about if this is you or this is a company that's going to last 10, 20, 50 plus years, what is that logo and how does it survive? Right? So let's take a look at an example. Right? I had to pull Apple as, as an example because it's a pretty iconic logo, certainly something that we'd all recognize. The first Apple computer logo ever was this one. Right? If that stayed, it has like a picture of Isaac Newton sitting under a tree and it has this scripted font that says Apple Computer Company. Uh, if that endured as the Apple Computer logo, would it be nearly as iconic as it is today? Not at all. Right? So sometimes you have a first stab at something that looks like this, right? and then you can see how it trends forward in the world of Apple. Right? And actually, there should be another uh, addition because they adjusted it slightly for the new flat stuff uh, in iOS 7 uh, when that happened. So we look at the, the original rainbow Apple logo endured from 1976 to 1998. It's a pretty good span of time right, for one logo. Right? Then it adapts into the monochrome. Steve Jobs comes back. We simplify things, and we, we sleek things up a little bit. Then we get into the stylized kind of 3D because that was trendy in the mid-2000s. 
right? And then they, they shifted one step further, dropped away some of the shadow and the embossedness and the shininess as you go forward. But you could see that once they transitioned from the original rather ugly logo into their iconic Apple, right? The, tra the trends and the fads can affect the logo, but it's essentially the same logo over time, right? And so that makes it a very, very good, strong logo. So in the logo design process, there's a variety of steps. This is very similar to the graphic design process or to the um, you know, architectural design process. Generally, it's starting with some kind of a design brief. Right? In the case of today, you're going to be designing a logo for yourself. Therefore, you invent the design brief. Right? You're going to do research, thinking about what, what other logos exist, what other things are happening in the, the um, the space that you're trying to design the logo, i.e., what other architecture students are designing logos and what do they look like, right? Um, you want to reference what else is out there. And then you're going to go into a phase of sketching and conceptualizing, finally reflecting back on what you did, and then ultimately presenting it. In your case, you're presenting it to yourself, so it's not that big of a deal, right? And sometimes it's the absence of things that make it interesting, right? Um, this is a, by a company called Just Creative Design who does logos. Um, this is their kind of sketching diagram of how they go through the logo process. It's essentially the same stuff that I just talked about. Most of the time is spent sketching and conceptualizing, right? getting different ideas out and trying to figure out what, what fits best. Uh, but you can see that research is also big and revisions are also big. So both of those things are kind of this iterative cycle of design which we're used to as we go forward. So let's take a look at how an example design might come about. Um, so this was a photograph of, of you know, the little fist, right? And they wanted to adapt this into a logo. So they did some sketching and you know, kind of came up with a rough conceptualization of what this uh, logo would be and then kind of started to break it down into component pieces, right? A little bit more, um, you know, if we go from this, which is the, the freeform sketch, into this, it's a little more rectilinear, right? push it a little bit further so we're abstracting it, right? And then we get into Illustrator and we start adjusting um, shapes and we start putting those shapes together. So you can kind of see how this is following through. Do a little bit of a rotation here, right? Starting to change the colors and we end up with the graphic that represents the original photo, right? And then they push it forward and start adding a little bit of text to it, right? And then you can see how it works in a color version, and then in a grayscale version, and in a black and white version. You want to think in those three because a lot of times your logo is going to be printed in color, in black and white, uh, and or in grayscale. And then taking it all the way a step further, how it might conceptualize into a set of um, you know, business cards, envelopes, et cetera, right? letterhead. So if we go back to the design brief, you want to correct. <laughs> can't talk this morning. You want to question the client, right? In, to, in today's world, you're going to be questioning yourself on this, about the intended purpose. What are you going to use this logo for? Why are you soliciting a new logo? You know, what is the history of your old logos, etc.? Be certain to include where this is to be used, right? Are you going to put the logo on t-shirts? Are you going to put it on the, you know, business cards? Are you going to put it on envelopes? You know, what, what are you going to be using it for? Is it going to go on the web, etc.? It's also a good time to talk about how much it's going to cost for you to do this work in the first place. Right. And I intersperse a variety of logos just to get your brain thinking. Right. Then you move into the research phase. And this is um, globally what's going on right, with logos. What, what industry does this logo belong to? Therefore, what other logos are like that in this industry? Right. You're dealing with something that's maybe personal landing page oriented, or maybe it's architecture oriented. What other logos are out there? What do those look like? Right? Go to the big architecture firms. What do all those logos look like? Right? And so that's a good way of getting background information. Right? What's the history of previous logos? A lot of you took 130 and had to draw a logo in 130. Right? Did you like that logo? Did it work out? Did it not work out? Should you adapt that logo now, or should you start fresh? Right? You want to think about that. What are your competitors using for logos? So, were you in 130 and you saw somebody else's logo and it looked really good, right? What, what's, how can that inspire you to create uh, your logo? Right? You want to look into successful logo designs. The great thing is that we have Google, so you can do a Google image for, search for logo and you can look at 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of logos to get ideas, which is great. Obviously, there's a bunch of logos that I throw up here um, that are all from this method. Right? What are the current styles? Right? Is it a, kind of a 3D embossed look? Is it a flat design? In the, um, several years ago, when Apple introduced iOS 7, they switched from kind of a shiny, semi-3D look to all the icons to a flat, um, no shadows look to the icons. And you'll see that if you look at the iOS stuff. And now if you look at um, OS 10, it's, it's very similar to that. Windows followed suit, and they do it now. So, and a lot of companies kind of switched the trend. And so when that trend switches, do you want to follow suit with that trend or not? And you want to think about that, right? Then you move into sketching and conceptualizing. So how are you going to uh, you know, make this logo? What are the, my various ideas? How does it come out, right? This is great for old-fashioned pen and paper sketching, right? What's it going to look like and, and, and that sort of thing, right? You want to fall back on your research and reference those things that you've already looked at because that can help um, produce a lot of various ideas. So here's an example, another example of uh, kind of how a logo design process comes through. This is a bunch of conceptual sketches about what is this logo ultimately going to become, right? And here's a few ideas that they were coming through about how this might produce itself. So then how did they go about actually creating the final logo, right? A variety of curves coming together, some subtle gradients to create the, um, you know, the color space. You can kind of see how it smooths together. It's a nice 3D effect. Right? And then they went through and, and spent a lot of time selecting what's the right font, right? what's the right spacing, um, and how does that kind of evolve into the image of the brand, right? then putting it together. How does it look in color? How does it look in black and white or grayscale? Both of those are important too. So they added a little bit to the grayscale version instead of just a plain grayscale version. It's all gray, but they added those little white lines that indicate the three-dimensionality to the logo. Right? So it's, it's really thinking of it as a separate piece. Then you go back to reflection. And this is always a good idea. You want to step away from your work and revisit it. And is it doing what you think it should be doing? Right? Is it being successful or not? Right? This is also a great time to lean over to your neighbor. And you'll see in exercise 117 one of the steps is to ask your neighbor what they think of what you've done, right? And I'm going to mandate that you do that. Get some feedback, right? Think about it a little bit more, tweak it a little bit more, and that's going to help this overall design process. I love this one. I think it's great. Right? Grab it. And it has a little rabbit in between. It's cute. Anyway. Now, this is a Japanese beer, but a pretty iconic logo. Matching business card. Right. Then you get to the presentation phase. This is where you're distilling down the best ideas, and you're trying to make a final version of the logo, what it's really going to be. So you've gone through. You've, gotten, you've got a bunch of ideas. You've distilled it down into what you think. You ask your neighbors what they think. They give you feedback on it. Then you, then you sit down, and you really make a nice final version of what it's going to be. Right? If the client doesn't end up liking it, guess what? You're going back and, and starting over. Right? And you might also have a presentation of something like this. This is the Mall of America logo where you have the general logo of what the standard Mall of America would look like, right? and then you have some variants of how it might be used depending on what the format would be. Then they might have seasonal variants, you know, the 4th of July variant, the Christmas variant, or the holiday season variant, the Valentine's Day variant, and how does, how does it apply over time? Right? It might be something that's worth doing. It might not be. For your case, I don't imagine seasonal variants is the right uh, strategy, but it's important to recognize that that does happen. Uh, in the world of design. You want to learn from others. One of the most successful logos of all time is the Nike swoosh. Right? How they came up with it, I don't know. Right? But it's endured from the very, very beginning of Nike all the way through to today. And it's something that is so, it involves no text. Right? It's about as simple as it can possibly get. And at the same time, it's easily one of the most recognizable logos. Right? That's success in logo design. Okay? So why have brands succeeded? A lot of times, simplicity is huge. A lot of times, it's distribution. So Starbucks might not be the simplest logo in the world, but you see Starbucks all the time. And therefore, it's successful, because you're, you're beat over the head with it. Right? 
Typography is also critical. We spent a lot of time, a whole lecture, talking about typography and fonts and, and choosing the right fonts, etc. Right? Fonts can be absolutely critical for some logos. Um, generally, it has to do with if you're using initials or you know, the company name or something like that, the font is obviously critical. If it's Nike, the font is completely not critical because the swoosh is the logo. Right? So it varies. Right? You have to choose the right font. Does it reflect the right business? Is it the right style of font? Right? If you want it to be contemporary, is it contemporary font, et cetera? Right? You might have to design your own font or design your own letters so that they are appropriate if you can't find the font. Remember, you guys can load custom fonts. So if you are using one that's text-based, go ahead and browse the internet and find a font that, that is appropriate. Right? And the little details really matter. The spacing and the kerning, if, you, if all you have is three or four letters, they better be perfect letters. The spacing better be perfect. Right? You will really want to think about that carefully. So let's look at some of the iconic text-based logos. Right? FedEx, IBM, Coca-Cola. Right? Those are all font-based. Right? Nothing else other than the font and the letters themselves. Yet at the same time, they're very, very iconic. CNN, another good example. Right? Just letters. Disney is another really good one. Right? It's a, it's a scripted font. It's, kind of, it's, it's a hard font to actually use, but it pulls and is consistent year after year. Uh, NASA is another good one right, of fonts. So there comes a point in time where I always get to, to do something that might inspire you slash blow your mind a little bit. Okay? Most of you have seen the FedEx logo before, right? Okay. How many of you have ever noticed the arrow in the FedEx logo? Right? Good, a few of you. Okay, so for those of you that haven't seen it, we blow your mind right now. There's an arrow right in the middle of the FedEx logo. You will never look at the logo the same way, right? These moments that happen in the design process are absolutely fantastic. And so if you can hide something like this in there, right, that just makes the logo that much better, right? The arrow is appropriate for FedEx, it's a shipping company, right? So whoever came up with this spent a lot of time with the type. It's not just the font, right? It's how it's used and how it comes together. And those little, little tiny, um, you know, hidden gems that are in something like this really make a difference. Okay. Another example: a font based with a little bit of background, right? One is a thinner font; part of it's a thicker font. You you use those two together, right? I really like this. I think it's a very, very clean, clear logo that works nice for a typeface design company, right? Um, and so it's just little things that you want to think about. You want to avoid all the cliches, right? If you're doing something for a globally recognized company, don't do a globe, right? It's just, ah, you know, it's, it's, it's way too, um, I, it's just, it's obvious, right? No clip art, no light bulbs for ideas or any of that kind of stuff, right? It's never going to work out well. You also don't want to copy from an existing logo because if you copy an existing logo, guess what? It already belongs to somebody else. And so you're never going to be able to steal that brand. So you want to create something that's unique and something that's, that's yours. But no clip art. Right? When we get into the phase of output files, you want to think about a fairly large format. Um, 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels is usually a pretty good size. If you're doing something with a lot of text, like that, that image that I had of the Oklahoma Contemporary, this one that's longer and skinnier, Maybe you end up doing it a little bit different in format. You give yourself a little bit more space. You can always scale down. It's much harder to scale up. Right? You output as a JPEG or a PNG 800 pixels, 72 DPI, something like that. That's for the web. Um, you may have noticed in browsers, there's little, little bitty tiny icons. Like if you go to Google, there's a little blue square with a G in it. Maybe you've noticed that. Maybe not. I'll show you in a second. Um, those little logos are called fav icons. Um, it's 16 pixels by 16 pixels, so they're little bitty things, but you might be creating that version of it as well. You want to make sure you save the Adobe Illustrator AI file so that you can go back and edit it or re-export it as necessary. Right? And you want to think about black and white, grayscale, and color right? and how those are appropriate. I'm only asking for one um, version today, so if you just have black and white or you just have color, that's fine, but you want to think about it in those um, contexts. 
Right? So these are a variety of other examples that I think are, are well done. This one's just humorous. Right? Another set of very iconic images that represent. I like that one too. Here's another design process. I'll end with this one um, because I think it's pretty good as, as an iterative design process. Initial sketch sketches for Jigsaw Internet, right? Uh, a little bit of 3D modeling. This was in the primary color phase where Google and eBay and everybody were creating their logos, right? Um, put it together with some font. The font is horrible, right? But uh, this could exist as an internet uh, company in about you know, 2001 or two, something like that, right? And then kind of abstracting it into what it would be in a current day scenario. And maybe you play around with it a little bit more. I think this is much more successful. And then how does that actually play out into a business card uh, or something like that? So it's really playing it all the way across multiple fields, OK? So I'm going to switch over, and we're going to, to look at actual um, creation of, of the logos in just a second. OK, so in exercise 117, obviously I'm asking you to create uh, a logo. And we started with a, an artboard of 1,500 pixels by 1,500 pixels. So I'm going to go up to File and then New. And I'm going to change my width and height to be 1,500 px by 1,500 px. Right? Uh, I can change my units to be in pixels, too, so that you can see it's 1,500 by 1,500. Uh, and I'll go ahead and say OK, which gives me a nice square to start working with uh, in this design process. So um, there, I don't have something scripted in terms of what I'm going to do. Um, so I can't promise you that whatever I create right now is actually going to be attractive. <laughs> but I'm going to make some stuff up uh, as we go forward. Uh, so I want to show you a few things today that are, that are important. Um, and We'll, uh, we'll look at the kind of the techniques more than what actually turns out. So as you've seen before, um, we have obviously the pen tool. We can create any custom shape we want. We also have a rectangle tool to be able to create rectangles. So I'm going to start with a rectangle, right? And I'm actually going to make it a square, something like that. And I'm going to give that square some kind of a background color. So right now it has a white fill with a black outline. The outline, I want to go away altogether. So I'm going to click the little um, none red slash so that I get none. I know it's right behind my head. I apologize for that. Right? And then I'm going to change the color of the square. Um, and by the way, we're going, to color, we're going to cover color theory next class. So your colors might not be perfect until next class, but that's OK. Right? And so let me go ahead and pick some kind of an orange color or something like that. And I end up with that. Okay. Now let's say I want to add some text. Right? So I'll type, I don't know, a G. Right? It's obviously nowhere near big enough, so let's, let's try to make that a little bit bigger. Um, I do not want there to be a stroke. And it would be nice if it, sorry, here's, here this is. Let's make it bigger. Nowhere near big enough. Right? And I also want to pay attention to uh, what the font is. So um, I play, play around with the various fonts. Um, and for lack of something better, I'll leave it as this. Let's bump it up a little bit more, maybe 900. All right, so I have this. Let me go ahead and make that. Um, sorry. Take this, and I'll move it over here. And I want this, then, to be overlaid on this particular orange backdrop. right? So I have a couple options. Right now, I just have the square with the black in front of it. right? But in reality, maybe I want it to be cut out of this, this um, orange background. 
And so I'm going to use something that's called the Pathfinder tools. And so if I go to Window and then Pathfinder, right, it's going to bring up something called the Pathfinder tools. And it's going to allow me to combine uh, or to subtract from various shapes. The one other thing, since this is text, I actually have to convert it into a live object. So I'm going to go up to Type, and I'm going to go to Create Outlines. And that will make it uh, an object rather than a font, right? so that it's, I can actually work with it. Okay? So I have the type here, and I have the background. They're both objects. And now I can play around with the shape modes. So for example, right, let's say I had the G sitting over here, and I had the square. If I select both of them, right, and I click this shape mode, which is Unite, it's going to make one continuous shape out of the G and the box. Okay, So let's go. Uh, it's going to pick the shape that's on top as the primary. So if I sent this to the back, arrange, send to back, and I were to select these two, and I add, it'll turn orange. Right? But notice it's now one object. Right, rather than the rest of the G. If I did instead, right, if I did this one, right, which is minus the front, right, it would subtract the front off of the G, giving me just this piece of it left. Okay. If I did this one, it says give me the intersection, which is going to leave me with that piece. Right, so you see how these combine shapes really well. Okay. And finally, we get to the subtract, right? the exclude. So let me bring this over, oops, bring this over on top of that shape. We'll select them both and exclude. And now I get this shape cut out of the square. And so to help see this, maybe I need another square. options, arrange, send to back. Right? And so now you can see that that's transparent. It's cut out of the original shape. Does that make sense? Okay. So these Pathfinder tools can be very, very useful. The, there are, so those are the shape modes for how they come together. I'm going to back up here for a second to where we are right here. Uh, and let me go ahead, while I'm still here, I'm going to throw this in the background so that we can see when it becomes transparent. Something like that. Okay. Now these pathfinders do something slightly different. So in this case, it's going to divide the shape. So let's say I had this, again, overlapping. And I selected this, and I selected this. And I clicked on the divide shape. It's going to give me three separate shapes. So if I use the direct select, the white arrow, I can actually move all of these as separate individual pieces because it chopped them up. Okay. We go back. Oops. One more here, right? We can get to the next one here, which is trim. So if I take this shape and I take this shape and I click on trim, right? It will trim the shape that's behind into separate pieces, right? Leaving my front object together. Okay. If we go back here and I get to this one, Right, which is merge. If I take this and I take this, it will merge the two objects together, right? Very similar to uh, the trim. The difference here is that if I were to select the object as a whole, it will still move as a group. All right, so we're back. We can get to the last one, which is crop, which would be. Right, leave the intersected area of the two shapes. And this one, I've never used this one, outline. Not sure what outline does, but we'll, we'll try it, see what outline does. Oh, lo and behold, it creates outlines. Right. Uh, and then this one is minus the back. So if we take this and this, and we subtract minus the back, right, it'll take the back off of the front. Right. So again, we have a variety of options that we can play with. right? And I'm encouraging you today to, to use these as part of your logo. right? So maybe I take something like this. right? Maybe I take these two pieces, and I subtract out 
so that it's transparent there, right? And this is just there so that you can see that it's transparent. And then maybe we take another uh, you know, another box that goes around it. Something like that. Let me flip so that it has an outline. We'll increase the stroke a bit. Right? And I end up with, I can get rid of that piece, and I end up with whatever it is that, that is my logo. Maybe I change the colors on it. Maybe that's the black version, et cetera. So that's one strategy. Um, obviously, there's, there's a million different ways of deciding what to do and how to do it. Right? Um, if I wanted to have something with a gradient on it instead, right, I can come over to the gradient tool. Um, and we can show gradient here as well. If I select the object and then I apply, let's say, a linear gradient, right, I can change the angle. We'll go to 45. Let's do negative 45. Right? I can also change how much of it is black. Right? I can change how the fade happens, right? something like that. And I can get it to fade off to one side. So it just depends on what it is that you're trying to do. Okay? So that's gradient. We've done Pathfinder. Uh, remember, we have the, the ability to adjust um, the width right here. So if I wanted, say, part of this line to end up being a little bit fatter, right? I could join. I could, I could make it get you know, from one end. I could say, this is really thin. Right, and it gets thick as it goes around. I mean, I, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how it, how it evolves. Then remember, it's always worth going back and saying, is it really doing what I want it to do, or is it not doing what I want it to do? Okay. So today, your, your purpose is to, to play around with the Pathfinder tools and how those work, right? and to work through kind of creating a logo that, that represents yourself, um, that, that looks the way you want it to, um, and that can be uh, rather iconic in its long-term lasting um, ability. Okay. Are there any questions? No? Um, like I said before, I always really like seeing how these turn out, so I can't wait to see what you come up with. Um, and um, hopefully that'll be good. Let me just make sure there's nothing else. Now, do make sure you do part three where it says talk to your neighbor. So after you get a good version that you like, lean over to your neighbor and say, what do you think? And give feedback to each other. Right? You should comment on at least three other logos on this exercise. Mm -hmm. So Pathfinder is under Window and then Pathfinder. And if you want to take text and convert it into a shape, it's under Type, Create Outlines. I don't have text selected. That's why it's grayed out. Those are the two, two things.